You're listening to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. Visit our website for free resources to aid you in your pursuit of self-liberation, old Vanu publications, podcasts, guest articles, and much more. Go to vanupodcast.com. And now, your hosts, Shane and Jason. And welcome to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to coercion. I'm your host, Shane. This podcast is covered by BIPCOT's No Government License, so as reuse and modification to anyone except for government agents and the pledge use thereof. Learn more by, uh, by visiting BIPCOT.org. So I'm back to recording after my week-long road trip through the Midwest. Uh, obviously, I went to the 7th Annual Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest, uh, but I also got to spend a couple of nights at Ben Stone's house in Ohio. Uh, I didn't record any podcasts, but I did go on uh, Brett Vinat's show, uh, The School Sucks Podcast, so you should see that episode out uh, in the next uh, week or two. Uh, anyway, today is yet another episode in our seemingly ever-growing uh, crypto anarchism series. I'm joined again by one of my favorite guests, Jamin Bakonic. Uh, Jamin is a hardware hacker, permaculture farmer and an unschooling parent uh, to a few little ones uh, we'll talk about uh, making homebrew cyber weapons for fun and profit uh, it's sure to be well fun i hope <laughs> so uh jamin welcome back to the volume podcast sir uh, how are you doing tonight oh thanks for having me back shane i'm doing pretty good man Good to hear. Good to hear. So, uh, so yeah, Jamin, uh, we uh, it was awesome seeing you and Karen uh, at the uh, Midwest Peace Liberty Fest again, man. Uh, it's all it's always great to to see you guys. And plus, uh, you kind of gave me a demonstration of some of the things that we're going to talk about tonight. So uh, that's uh, that's always uh, always a good time. Uh, I learn a lot more by uh, by visualizing rather than you know um, you know just learning you know uh, searching my way through it. So I appreciated that. Oh, likewise, man. I, I really wanted to have some like more demo stuff set up there, but I just didn't end up having time to do it all. And then um, Murphy's Law kind of struck with some stupid things like a cable failure wasn't diagnosed as such right away. And it looked like I had some issue with something else and mm -hmm. um, just, you know, but uh, yeah, thinking maybe for next year to uh, have some more demonstration type things up. Um, you know, like some of the stuff we'll talk about tonight, like the pirate box and um, the freedom box mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, in different, you know, I guess, in, you know, um, intelligence tools, like information gathering and stuff, just kind of right. signals intelligence. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and obviously the objective for, for uh, you know, this evening and a, and a lot of stuff that you do uh, and you call it as such and I appreciate that. But basically, uh, you know, hacking tools for Venuans. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's very, very relevant to this podcast, very relevant to what we're talking about. And uh, some of the things we'll, uh, we'll be discussing uh, are specifically targeted to, uh, you know, nomads, uh, more specifically like people living in uh, vans or in uh, RVs. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be a fun conversation, man. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I'm uh, really excited for it. But uh, for, uh, we'll, we'll start with this and uh, you know, there may be some new listeners uh, to the podcast now from the interview I did with the Smuggler uh, and also Ivan the Troll. So for those who don't know who you are, uh, why don't you start by providing a uh, brief introduction? Uh, who are you and uh, what do you do? Uh, I, I guess I'm primarily a researcher and a tinkerer with a little bit of entrepreneurship thrown in. Uh, I have did some IT back in the early 2000s. I'm, you know, pretty much uh, hack, hack schooled using the Trivium method um i basically don't uh i have I took a break from the industry and started working on the uh, permaculture sites that i've worked on including the, the place i am now and i got back into um doing some of this stuff doing a uh an education project that i call neuron and it is basically a um complete turnkey open source Linux based educational system for kids and mm. people that are new to Linux. Um, the one system that you have has, I mean, that's the flavor of Linux that's on it. Right. So you're familiar with how it's set up. So it's very, like it has the everything. It's like a Swiss army knife that someone can just go and experience all the, all you have, all Linux has to offer without kind of having to uh, do all the configuration to get everything to work and everything. 
Right, and and I will say on that note. Um, so this is your your baseline uh, Linux to try to like people who who are coming from Windows or or uh, you know Mac and haven't used Linux before. Um, and uh, I will say I've been using it for the past uh, the past three months or so. I uh, used it a lot more than I thought I would. Um, and uh, I mean, yeah, it's uh, you know uh, it's a, a nice slick machine. So um, I. I I'd uh, you know I'd, I'd certainly recommend it, but uh, we'll, we'll uh, I'll ask about this momentarily, but uh, or I guess we can talk about it now um, since we're on the subject. <clears throat> but uh, you also have um, the uh, seriously locked down ghost pads, right? Um, why don't you talk a little bit about those and, and what features those have? Yeah, those um, those have a complete firmware replacement with um, a heavily audited open source project called Coreboot. So they're locked down on a firmware level, and they also have the Intel management engine neutralized. Nice. And uh, if you're not, I mean, that's a whole rabbit hole we could go down. I, I don't know how much I've talked about it, probably quite a bit on here before, but um, it is essentially, in a nutshell, a small computer embedded into the processor that has complete control over the entire system, um, bypassing any control the processor has it is it controls the system on a lower level than the processor does mm -hmm. so it's a huge huge security risk and um you know potential backdoor through projects like the sigint enabling project that the dot gov have gotten busted for mm -hmm. um it's this is like right down the alley of the type of stuff that they got nailed for so um yeah, so basically those machines, they start out with a hardened platform. And then on top of that, I install a uh, operating system called Cubes OS. And Cubes OS is a highly compartmentalized system that relies on um, <clears throat> para-virtualization to break up the system into a group of virtual machines to isolate everything from everything else so that even if there are breaches in security on one one component of the system, it doesn't affect the rest. Right, right. So... Yeah, and for for the listeners, I will um, I will I will just say you know since I, I took a look at it, I mean it was it's uh, you know a pretty pretty slick uh, slick UI, and once you understand the the verbiage, what they're talking about, um, which I mean there's there's only like ten different full uh, ten, ten different I guess um, virtual machines, and um, I think there might be like an only couple couple of few that you'd use on a on a daily or you know on a regular basis from what I remember, Jamin. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's uh, you know yeah, it's, uh, yeah. nice nice slick little, slick little user interface, and that's that's what I want to upgrade this uh, this ghost pad to is one of the more locked down ones because i did i did message you on signal i was like uh question man why is google maps on this it seems a little insecure to me um but oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, make, it makes sense now <laughs> yeah that i mean that was this, you know the thought put into the user base for that was people transitioning and if they are already using those products to not have a uh um you know any type of learning curve it's already in the menu where it probably used to be on windows even you know Right, and and it does have everything. I mean, I looked on there, and there's Audacity, there's a video editor, there's a photo editor, um, there's a bunch of different word processors, and, and it, you know, additional ones too, uh, even uh, LibreOffice. Um, so I mean, it's got it's got pretty much anything you would need. Um, and uh, I, th I think, yeah, like I said, I think it's a great introductory tool to Linux. And I would still even think that um, even on like even though that's not one of the most secure ghost pads that you sell, it's still probably a whole hell of a lot better than Windows, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, it's. You know, those that one you have there is Debian based. I actually transitioned to um, Zubuntu, the base of them, just because of how slow Debian can be when it comes to um, integrating new drivers and stuff into their their system. And uh, I actually expanded the gaming capabilities a lot, so I have models that are um, completely set up to run Steam as well. So they can run Steam, and you know, Steam at this point has thousands of Linux Linux compatible games now. Okay, very nice, very nice. So the the game the uh, the more secure gaming platforms are coming to awesome, awesome. Um, so I guess uh, is is there anything else in uh, you know in relation to Ghost Pads that you're working on that you that you'd like to uh, you know tell the listeners about? Um, just um, basically working on expanding the model line. There are other compatible units 
that are compatible with the firmware modifications. And um, sometimes it's a little bit of R&D to actually make it happen. Um, like there, there's always caveats that you run into when you switch to a different board and work with trying to get it to work. I've already, like there is a workstation laptop. It's the, actually the one that I showed you at Fest that I had the GPU in that I was mm. using yeah. as the cracking system. Well, those are compatible. Yeah, and that's that's a um, that's a, a big that's a big screen too. It's a big laptop. Oh yeah, that's a 17-inch mobile workstation that can have up to like a 8 gig NVIDIA 980 GPU in it. Nice. So nice. it's still you know you know fairly powerful. Um, yeah. But yeah, so that would really top out the model line. Here, can you hold it one second? Sure, no problem. Oh, God damn it. You know it was a robocall, too. <laughs> Probably, yeah. <laughs> it was. I swear to God. I swear to God, dude, looking at the caller ID. Oh, my God. <laughs> Kill, maim, destroy, frag. <laughs> okay. God damn, God damn robots harassing me all the time. <laughs> so I think you're talking about uh, expanding your uh, your model line or your product line. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's that system, and and another significant thing that it actually supports up to sixty four. I'm sorry, thirty two gigs of RAM. Huh. Um, up until now, the well, actually, I have another Lenovo system that is halfway supported at this point that supports 32 as well. But the top um, memory quantity that supporting system that I've been selling is 16. So I've, when I get some of the bugs worked out of the process to get these other ones going, um, I'll have, you know, ones that support 32 gigs. And really with, cu with cubes, it makes a big deal, big deal of difference because, um, if you are running it as a full-blown desktop replacement, like right now I'm running for my search and pretty much most computer-related tasks except for gaming and maybe, uh, you know, media editing or something. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I'm running a, a T420 with 16 gigs and a quad-core i7 hooked to a 4K TV. So I can really easily max out the memory if I start opening up a ton of virtual machines and filling all those pixels with different virtual machines doing stuff. So I frequently sure. have to like um, go and thin out e browser tabs or whatever to have enough ver enough memory to start a new virtual machine. So 32 gigs would be really nice for that use case. But for your typical use case as a laptop to do just like the private research and stuff like that where you're not, I mean, I, I'm talking about, I'll, I'll have vir, like maybe three or four of the core virtual machine, app virtual machines running, and I'll have browsers in each of them, and they'll have like, you know, 30, 40 tabs a piece in each virtual machine. So it's, you have to be pretty extreme to maximize, mm, right. maximize it. Um, right. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's 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 great to hear, man. So um, I I know that uh, obviously you take you take uh, you take uh, custom orders for these ghost pads. Uh, people want to uh, to get a hold of you and uh, uh, you know uh, you know buy something you already have made or uh, or uh, you know put in a custom order. Uh, how do they do that? Um, they can just go to my email. It's jamin at semisynthetic dot net, and uh, just shoot me an email. Um, if they want to, uh, after that, you know, swap PGP keys, I can do that, and we can go from there. Fantastic, yeah, and I, I would, uh, I would certainly recommend. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, these are these are you know great deals for, uh, for you know, for for laptops, um, and uh, obviously, uh, security is uh, something we've talked about very much uh, on this crypto anarchism series. Uh, so definitely do pick up a uh, pick up a ghost pad. Uh, I definitely uh, definitely do recommend it. So. Um, I suppose uh, uh, we can go ahead and uh, and kind of uh, get into it here, and we, we've kind of already alluded to one of the subjects we're going to we're going to touch on, and that is uh, is uh, Wi-Fi cracking. It's kind of funny, man, because I reached out to you. It would have been maybe like uh, September of last year, 
and uh, I was in an apartment with oh, no yeah. Wi-Fi. And uh, you know, I, I sent you a message and said, just just curious, how difficult is it to you know crack a Wi-Fi password? And you kind of gave me an explanation. And at the time, I, I got kind of I thought about it. I read what you put, and I was no, it's not worth it. I'll be all right. Um, <laughs> it's not not that big of a deal. But um, it would have come in, it would have come in handy if I would have known how to do uh, how to do it back then. And and for uh, for a van nomad on the road, um, being able to you know get into uh, Wi-Fi networks would, would certainly be handy. So um, I guess first off, uh, for for those who may not be familiar with the the, the concept or the idea, um, what is uh, Wi-Fi cracking, and uh, what tools, software, hardware do you need to to get started doing this? Well, Wi-Fi cracking is taking the encrypted transmissions um, between an access point or even between clients and um, finding some way to decrypt it and make um, sense of the data. So there are a handful of different ways that it can be encrypted. And if there are strong passwords used, they are fairly, you know, fairly good encryption, like WPA2 is fairly good if you have a strong enough password. But a lot of people don't, and a lot of people keep default passwords, and a lot of people use common passwords, and a lot of people add common strings in, of characters onto common passwords. So, like even brute forcing the password is sometimes doable, but um, that's really the worst case scenario like you don't want to try to do that that's <laughs> you know that's not very fun um so you know what you do is you have you have a system that monitors the network and you're basically looking for a certain negotiation between the client and the access point and that negotiation is going to give your your program clues as to what the hash is so and it's going to make it a lot easier to crack so what you do is you just either you can either have a system passively just sniff the network and you know typically the way this is deployed against people is you know they have a sniffing system and when you get home all your devices connect so basically as soon as those devices connect it has these opportunities to, you know, grab a handshake or after a power outage or, you know, just think of any time where your devices are just meeting each other again. Right. Um, even if you turn, turn one on, you know. So, um, so that's, you know, passive scanning can find that out. So once you have that um, handshake, then you can take that handshake to an offline cracking program. And it can, uh, with enough GPU power, excuse me, usually crack it after, uh, you know, a certain amount of time, depending on how strong the password is. Right, right. But, you know, so there all, you know, there's all those variables. Yeah, right, right. So, so I guess, um, <clears throat> Um, what's, uh, so, so what tools, software or hardware does someone need to, to, to get started? I know the setup that you showed me was, um, that's, um, that's, that's, uh, that laptop with a 17 inch monitor. Um, and there was, uh, there was Hashcat and, uh, I'm sure there was, uh, some sort of a Linux version that you had to have for, for, for that sort of, uh, for that sort of function. So could you t tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, what's, what, what tools, uh, someone would need? Sure, sure. I mean, that, that system was actually running a uh, experiment that I'm, I put a bunch of stuff on. Um, but if I was just using it for that purpose, I would, or I could even put a dedicated drive in there for it, but I would either be using Parrot Linux or Kali Linux for these purposes. And I've, I'm kind of test driving Parrot Linux right now. It was, I was turned on to it by a customer that really likes it. So Okay, and what would and what would the um, and just out of my own curiosity, what would the difference between differences be between uh, carrot and uh, or parrot and um, I guess Cali? Well, um, on the surface, it and really that's you know I haven't I've barely scratched the surface on either of them. There's so, there's so many tools, but on the surface, parrot is uh, it has more tools, and um, it. Uh, 
it just seems to have a uh, better user interface, like the way they have the menus and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I I also have I've used Kali a lot, and I have uh, a Kali on a Raspberry Pi that was also there um, that I had hooked up. And typically, you would use a system like a Pi to do the sniffing. Um, but you know, there's another element to everything. I was just talking, you know, firstly about the passive passive sniffing. There are active attacks you can do to force a handshake. Um, with the wireless tools included in either of those distributions, you you basically weaponize a, a laptop or a single board computer with the right wireless chipset. Wow. Okay. Um, because you have to have certain chipsets. You have to have certain chipsets to do what's called packet injection. And if you have a supporting card like that, um, that external card I showed you, that was velcroed to the the smaller ThinkPad, right. the smaller yeah, ghost yeah, pad yeah. ThinkPad. Yeah. Well, that that supports packet injection, and so so does the uh, chips that I swap into the ghost pads. Um to get rid of the Intel chips that are in there. So I actually upgrade the ghost pads with a wireless card that can do packet injection. So what packet injection can do is it can do all sorts of things like, um, well, first of all, it can deauth. It can send packets. It, um, it can basically send a signal that's telling the router and all the clients to disconnect each other. So, um, that's an attack that you you do to force a handshake. Right. So you basically use that capability, and um, there is a, you know there are a handful of utilities that are usually used to do that. But you know once you go to doing that, you have become detectable because intrusion detection software can detect stuff like that. Um. Like someone will get, someone's getting an alert, <laughs> okay, you know, really? if you do it in the wrong place. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. That, that was going to be my question was, so this, this, would this have to be like, you know, Joe Schmo and, and, you know, a suburb, like if you're just parked out front, like would, 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 would he, would he just, you know, you know, casually sitting around his house, get like a notification that this happened or would it be more, it'd probably be like an administrator for like the, the, uh, um, I'd guess the uh, service provider probably. Right. Well, the thing is the service provider really isn't hooked to his Wi-Fi. So you're attacking his home network. Um, so they don't really monitor anything like that. Like mm-hmm. people are sitting ducks to this stuff. Um, so pretty much, yeah, it's, you know, there, people are sitting ducks. There's really not much, you know, if you stayed in one place and you were constantly like gaslighting somebody or something <laughs> and you were, you know, you know, like if you were really, really retarded about it, you could probably get, busted somehow doing it to an individual but <laughs> okay now gotcha. if you were you know being acting shady around a business or like um i mean there's there's all sorts of you know, de- you know it depends on who you're fucking with really but yeah you're a normal person unless they have um devices like i'm trying to implement on um, people's networks like what you know one of the one of the services i want my f- my implementation of the freedom box to do is uh, intrusion detection. Um, there's really good intrusion detection out there now that can just send simple alerts so people know if they're being screwed with. Right. Um, right. But you would, you know, it would be constantly monitoring and everything. But yeah, I mean, you know, that people are widely vulnerable to this stuff. And I mean, uh, and we're talking about, you know, WPA2 being hard to crack. When people use WEP, that's not hard to crack. You don't need a big GPU or anything. That little core, ice, that little 12-inch ThinkPad would crack that. <laughs> so, um, so that, you know, if you're, war, you know, you, I guess I should, like, define the concept of war driving. You're, <clears throat> you're basically mapping the wireless access points all around you. You're running a program, you know, there's a program that's used mostly for uh, Linux devices and stuff called Kismet. 
and there is a there's a good one for Android called um, Wiggle, W I G L E, and uh, Wiggle actually you can take the data you get from there and upload it to their website, and they add it to a huge database. So much of the country is already totally mapped out. Really? And you can find, yeah, it's people, lots of people could find their access points on it. It's, it's massive. Um, you can, you know, you can actually take your wiggle data or your, your Kismet data and, you know, like download the Google, the, the Google earth, you know, picture for it. So, yeah, I mean, and it marks exactly where the networks are, like the people's houses. And, Interesting. And, you know, so, you know, when I when I refer to the Internet of Things as the Internet of Attack Vectors, this is what I'm talking about. Right, because the, the, the way, yeah, the, to be. the way that I understand, like if someone has, um, <clears throat> like some of the stuff is retarded, man. Um, like uh, you're starting your coffee with your smartphone, like that's dumb. Um, you don't need that. Um, oh, but yeah. like, like something like that, that's connect, like anything that's connected to your Wi-Fi network. Um, if, if any single, if any, if any one of those things has bad security on it or some sort of, you know, firmware that hasn't updated, that is some sort of vulnerability. Um, any one of those things can get them to get them access to your network. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, what you're doing, um, there are attacks you can use against devices to find like cache information on them and stuff too. I mean, there are so many things you can do. Um, there are a lot of uh, different ways some in internal reset schemes for routers can be exploited and give you the credentials you need. Like there is a WPS pin setup that you can basically get into remotely on a router and um, have like a below administrator level access to it. So, I mean, there are lots and lots of things. And, you know, with the IoT, it's, these things aren't all going to be kept up to date at all. And people are just going to have all these, all these leaks and uh, gaping doorways for people to come in and do whatever. Right. Right. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's not just, uh, it's not just governments guys. Um, you know, there's, uh, you know, corporations and private entities that, uh, you also want to keep your, your, uh, your, your data from, um, can guarantee that. Um, so, so basically, um, to, to get started doing this, you need a laptop, obviously, obviously, or some sort of computer you need, uh, um, either Linux Kali or Linux Parrot. I think is, 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 uh, the name of the other, uh, the other version um you need some sort of sniffer to yeah. do to do some of like if, if you're going to be sniffing for um i guess the hashes or the um or the uh the handshakes um you'll need some sort of sniffer device mm -hmm. to do that um and then i'm guessing as far as, as as for a piece of software um you would need sniffer uh, or you would need a uh, like hash cat um to actually try to crack that uh, that hash that you get well um the reason i was including hash cat in the workflow was because it is really uh really optimized for gpu acceleration um there are a lot of other cracking utilities that don't require as much setup like you have to have the proprietary drivers and everything else to get the um, gpu compute capability it's a little bit extra setup and everything that um you don't have to do with some of the other programs if that's not the hardware you're trying to use anyway so actually there is a you know collection of utilities called, you know, kind of collectively called Aircrack, Aircrack NG. And it is kind of the standard for this stuff um, that, you know, even in a lot of the more advanced scripts, these are the low level programs the script are, are calling on. And uh, that was the simple workflow I was demonstrating at the fest was, uh, you know, first you you have to put your wireless card into the right mode. You put it into monitor mode, and the you know like the command is airmon ng with the the correct arguments behind it. And then after it's in monitor mode, um, you go to the capture mode, and um, basically after you're in you're in capture mode and you capture the handshake, 
then you could go into the actual air crack program and um, then you could possibly crack the hash there depending on you know all the variables so like that, that's a simple workflow there but I mean there are a lot of other programs to do this um, you know kismet is a big one for sniffing too and it's the big war driving one like it uh, it's really good for logging all the data uh, and it's also been used forever like I remember war driving with a friend of mine back in like I don't know 2003 or something <laughs> using kismet and GPS GPS drive and kismet you know so this stuff um, it's which true, this, this isn't anything up. new was, then <laughs> No, no, but now now you can do it on a single board computer. And I mean, admittedly, like he was ahead of the curve because he had a car computer before anybody else did and stuff. Um, but that was one of the reasons he built it. But yeah, I mean, you integrate a GPS and a high power wireless card into any laptop really can do this. Right. It can do the information gathering. It's just that... Uh, with something like a Raspberry Pi, they take very little power, and you can take a USB battery pack and power them with it. So you can make this little little thing that fits in a shoebox, or a uh, you know you can disguise it multiple different ways, and you have a device that can do a bunch of different things, like all the stuff I'm talking about from the Mycroft AI. It's capable of to the you know pirate box to the freedom box to a you know Kali Linux um, electronic warfare weapon you know what I mean like the same the same principle applies and you basically swap out SD cards to do all that okay after you set them up <clears throat> interesting so since we're on the subject of Wi-Fi here uh, so so in, in, in uh, our messages when we we're kind of talking about or I guess getting ready for this episode. And I'm just going to read what what she puts uh, just for this part of the message, and then um, I, I'll have you explain it. And kind of, uh, you know, I guess uh, tell us uh, tell us uh, you know what all this means. But uh, you said signals intelligence set up for Wi-Fi pen testing and software defined radio scanning plus monitoring. So uh, tell us about that. Sure, sure. The uh, you know the Wi-Fi pen testing is what I've been talking about with uh, you know even using it using it as a white hat against your own stuff. Um, it's pretty important. Like if I found a great tool called router exploit that will run every known exploit against, you know, pretty much any router or router or even like IP cameras, you know, it'll run every one of them in like two minutes against your equipment. And you can be sure that none of them work, you know, um, that's the same way with, uh, auditing your Wi-Fi. I mean, and even signals intelligence on the level of uh, knowing if somebody is uh, is eavesdropping on your signal or your, mm -hmm. you know, there's all sorts of different. I mean, just uh, as a situational awareness element. Um, not even if you ever plan on, you know, expropriating someone's Wi-Fi or something. Just just to understand that that's there's a whole like spectrum out there that. Um, that there's are constant battles going on. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. Like, especially, you know, another thing that you could do with the same box is you could make an evil twin. Um, evil twins are responsible for stealing so much people, so much of people's stuff. Um, it's where you make a, a public Wi-Fi station that is named the same as an established one and you uh -huh. kick people off the established one and they rejoin yours because you have a boosted signal because you have an amplifier on it <laughs> and a wireless card that's yeah like i like that setup that i had with me with that antenna like you wouldn't want to stand in front of that thing like it, that could overpower pretty much anything if i was a bad boy enough to plug it all in and turn it on but, <laughs> right I mean, I'd never do anything like that. But. Of course not. No, never. Never. It's just for demonstration <laughs> only, only purposes. My, uh, Educational purposes yeah, only. Yeah, only in my Faraday cage. Right. <laughs> only in my Faraday cage. 
So yeah, I mean, what, what um, you're what you're what, what you're explaining there is basically counter surveillance, right? Um, and in, in a way, at least. What's that? I didn't. The Skype was glitching. Um, so yeah, what you're what you're explaining then, like you know, like um, um, you know, wa watching for. Uh, um, if, if you have, uh, you know, a little box that can monitor, um, you know, all the traffic uh, coming into your network as, as a way of defense, you're, it's, it's basically a means of counter surveillance. Sure, sure. Um, you know, it's making sure that you're you're actually secure in your realm. And if you if you don't have a lot, if you don't have all the stuff ratting you out all the time, you can make a uh, you know kind of a, a Taz. In in you know if if you read a lot of the crypto anarchist literature, a lot of a lot of those guys are talking about just creating these safe spaces where the you know the equivalent of the corner of the room in 1984 where the cameras couldn't reach you, right? And you know a uh, judicious judicious counter surveillance and signals intelligence and just awareness of how things work can go a long way and. I don't really expect people to sit there and like watch their computer for this stuff. I mean, that's not really even how any of this works at this point. I mean, yeah, you know, one of the other things I was going to talk about is the the up and coming open source AIs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's let's, already let's, let's talk an open about source it, yeah. AI. Well, right now there's an open source AI that's similar to an Alexa, and it's called Mycroft, and what makes it significant not only does it not spy on you and um you actually own it it's not just like a you know a remote eye of sauron in your house this thing is fully configurable and scriptable and you can teach it skills and there are already skills for automated monitoring and um you know a lot of the stuff i was just talking about so it's you know, it could be something that you could simply get an alert on your phone to say, hey, there's sketchy stuff going on or get an alert on, you know, through, you know, any type of, uh, you know, whatever, whatever you want. I mean, it's scriptable. You can do whatever you want with it. And we can. And there's a huge community behind it making um, skills for it. And there's a very kind of uh, bar of entry to be able to make the skills. Mm. Um, it's, uh, I mean, you, you don't know how to, you don't have to like know how to code and see or anything. It's like, uh, basically you have to know Python and, um, regular expressions and just like real basic, you know, object orientated, uh, languages that were made to be simple and quick. Mm -hmm. So... Right, um, right, right, and, and I think I, um, I, I think you're, I think uh, the angle that you're at least what uh, what uh, you know what we talked about, <clears throat> you're you're thinking um, like with uh, the like the personal AI like my, with using Mycroft, um, you're thinking about you know a bunch of a bunch of stuff for like RV and van uh, AI automation, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, everything from you know I you know, I most of this stuff is beyond what I can actually do with it, but. You know, I'm very much into getting these ideas in people's heads because I, I meet people all the time that are just ridiculously good at this stuff through, you know, selling the computers. So I'm sure someone could run with this. Um, I don't know exactly how you do it, but if you could integrate, if you could somehow basically uh, steal, you know, steal the data and integrate it from the Google data sets as well as Waze, considering they now have the... Uh, they both mark speed traps and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, and you could do it in such a way where it actually obscures where where you are or who you are. So, you know, that's, their, their AIs aren't collecting your data on you. And you're basically, uh, but, uh, you know, anyway, long story short, if you had that data combined with this AI and offline GPS as well, you could have... Uh, different skills for in like escaping for example like if you uh not only planning a route with less less bludgies on it but actually planning a route that doubles back on itself and does everything textbook that you would read in a you know like 
a military manual or, you know, spy manual on the stuff. Like yeah. it could, you know, it could figure that out in no time. Um, but I mean, those are some of the eventual capabilities that it could do. And I mean, most of those puzzle pieces are all there, just the data set connection, like just being connected to that. Um, like it already has all the navigation from open street maps and everything like that. That's all offline. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, being able to uh, switch to a system that isn't transmitting anything and isn't ratting you out while it's showing you where to go. Yeah, that's huge. I mean, that's... Um, yeah. But, you know, that's that's how that laptop was configured at the Fest. It had uh, a software-defined radio that I could scan radio frequency. Um, and there's a ton of stuff you can do with that. I mean, you can track... You can track airplanes with that. You can track like jetliners. Um, you can get into all sorts of trouble with them as well. But um, the ones that just receive, you can pretty much receive on most of the usable bands of radio frequency. And um, even like a lot of the digital stuff, it's trivial to, you know, turn it into analog voice. So you can use it as a radio scanner that, it isn't limited to, um, you know, it doesn't have channels locked out and stuff like that. Okay, interesting, interesting. Sorry, my, my mind jumped to, <clears throat> for some reason, my mind jumped to Ben Stone's books, Editions of Version and Sabotage, but um, I'm not going to say anything I'm thinking about right now. Um, <laughs> I'm, 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 sure, well, I'm sure the listeners can, can, can do some things. I'm sure you can as well, Jamin. <laughs> well, well um, I have two two kind of words that go along with that. It was another device that can be made. It's, it's called, and uh, it's called a D auth grenade and it just locks everybody out of everything in its entire radius wow. until it runs out of batteries. Like, Oh yeah. And that's trivial to make. And that's like, Oh, uh, you know, you can, that's through menu options and probably Cali and parrot at this point. Oh yeah. Parrot even has all the, yeah. Parrot even has all the car hacking tools in it. Okay. Okay. T tell tell us a bit about uh, or tell us a bit more about that. Uh, I, I guess more. Um, so obviously there's the uh, um, the stuff we, we we've discussed already. But um, what else could you do? Like a like a you know a, a mobile Vanuin, uh, you know van nomad hacker. Um, what other cool things could could, could you do? Um, cool or necessary things from the road, I guess. Well, um, well, one thing is uh, you can you can host your own own local Wi-Fi server for one so other Vanuans could connect to it and you can share data that way securely and that's basically what the Pirate Box project is ah. and uh, it you know it's you know basically the same configuration as all the other stuff I was talking about it, you just have a different SD card set up for Pirate Box in it um, so that's really cool um, you can actually make a pirate FM radio station out of a Raspberry Pi. Really? Okay. Oh yeah, and it's it's actually really powerful and it, and it can take over other radio like it can take over channels pretty easily. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, okay. I may or may not have had experience with pirate radio in the um, past. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. It's okay, um the way it works is there is an element in the Pi, I don't want to get too technical but it can be used to generate an FM radio frequency and it's tunable to like pretty much any of the FM stations on the dial, you know, like maybe a hundred and below. So uh, all you have to do is add an antenna wire to one of the pins on the Pi and you run this software and it turns it into a fairly powerful FM transmitter. Um, that actually transmits in a square wave. So you get, so it's like extremely disruptive. You get all these, um, harmonics on all these other channels, like all the way up to like 400 megahertz or something. Hmm. And like some of the harmonics are actually more powerful than your target channel. So it's like really, really illegal 
as far as the, the <laughs> FCC goes. And it's a it's actually a really dick move if you're screwing with somebody's stuff that is just like trying to do their radio thing. But uh, there is actually a way that you can put a filter on it and clean it up to the point where it's not a problem too. Gotcha. But, you know, sometimes you might want that problem. So that's another thing to think of, the, you know, the possibilities of having that problem, let's say. Um, right. Right. Yes. Yes. Again, along with I'm, the I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of Ben's book again. <laughs> Yeah, Ben's book keeps coming to mind, uh, and there's I don't know if you've if you've seen it, but there was a talk that was given at at uh, it was not not at Hackers Congress, uh, it was at Def or at Defcon, um, maybe 2016, and it was uh, it was called How to Overthrow a Government, and obviously the title piqued my interest, so I, I checked it out, and it was basically um, an hour of how um, you know how how hackers could basically overthrow world governments remotely just from a computer. Um, and he just kind of walked through like here's how here's how it could be done be super easy um you know they've they've done this before but there's no direction so um <laughs> but yeah i don't know that's that's what's coming to mind to me at least with, with with some of these tools oh yeah it's really cool you know back back when i first started getting into linux and stuff and you know started getting into some of this you know running wireshark on land networks back in like 98 or something you know um, sniffing land networks. Um, there was all this, uh, all these cool gadget that the gadgets that the phone freakers used and the old hackers used that you know the hack the telephone system and all these cool little boxes they got to make and I was always fascinated. But like all that technology was just obsolete and it just didn't make any sense to make all that. And there's just kind of like a new renaissance in it now. Um, like there are little things like Arduino microcontrollers that are the size of a uh, micro USB thumb drive that can pawn a Windows computer in 30 seconds if you stick it in. Wow. Like, oh yeah, it's, I was screwing around making one today actually. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's called a human interface device attack. What it does is it presents its, it, these are USB development boards for one. These, you know, they're, target purpose was like, okay, you want to make your own USB peripheral? No. All right. So hackers have uh, taken advantage of that and figured out, well, I'm going to make my own USB keyboard and mouse that executes my shell scripts on your computer. So you stick it in, it quickly opens a command prompt and it has all the right gestures and clicks and everything else written into the script. And it can do anything from, it can syskey your computer, you know, put a password on your database so you have to like reinstall, like it can exfiltrate data, um, it can exfiltrate passwords, um, you know, anything that the script gets away with running. They used them, they got really popular in, in pop culture, Mr. Robot, one of the episodes like that was the last ditch effort. The... Uh, the one girl who is basically socially socially under engineered herself to where she was, like she had this thumb drive and like you know stick that in if all else fails and just turn the computer on type thing. Mm -hmm. But um, so yeah, it's a uh, there's also you know I just thought it was a cool project to do with the Arduino. There's so many like I can make a uh, a flasher to do my EEPROM flashing that, for the ghost pads out of an Arduino. I'm just kind of getting into it. It's just another rabbit hole I've fallen down. Understood. So, so I guess a question that I was, you know, typing us, so I wouldn't forget it. Um, but yes, yeah, some, something that comes to mind because uh, you know, um, I know I would love to test out um, a lot of the things that we're we're talking about uh, today, just for you know educational research purposes. Just to like hell at the fest, I told you I, I, it'd be cool if if uh, you could try to hack the, uh, the the password to my my hotspot Wi-Fi. Like that's that's the sort sure. of stuff. The, the sort of stuff that. Um. <clears throat> yeah, that I'm talking about. Um, I, I'd be it'd be cool to, to test out a lot of these things. So I guess uh, c can we expect uh, like Venu and Hacker Kit sometime soon as like a, as as a, as a, a, a product from you? Um, is that uh, is that possible? Oh. Yeah, I mean that's in the works. I've basically uh, been spending a lot of time on R and D with different things. Um, you know everything from the Linux game boxes to 
this type of stuff. I've had a concept machine um, that I've made for myself numerous times throughout the years that has been kind of like one of these hacker boxes that also had like a a, a lot of uh, information in ebooks and just kind of like a uh, emergency laptop type of thing. Um, even you know something that would be interesting to preppers. Like all this stuff is great for um, you know any type of uh, breakdown of society is <laughs> worse than it is right now too, mm-hmm. because uh, you know having some signals intelligence is a good thing. Because a lot of like I didn't even get into the drone stuff, man. Like example, like there there are single board development boards small enough that they're trivial to add to a drone Mm. so you can have a drone doing all this monitoring and doing your war driving um and there's this one that one uh hack that i thought was hilarious is you can take a a cheaper remote control drone like a uh, regular rf control and um basically steal somebody's wi-fi drone with it oh god (laughs) uh, oh yeah oh yeah you uh, you attach the pie to the drone, um, and basically you f- you fly the drone drone up to it, like a certain range of the other one, and then you de auth it from its network, and <laughs> you pose as the access point. It connects to you, and then there's a uh, there's a script that runs that makes you be able to control both drones by your drone flying circles around the other one. Really? Um, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh yeah, man. People have no idea what is in store in the next very, very short amount of time. You know, yeah, five years and stuff. Yeah, it's 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 funny in these in these conversations, um, something that keeps coming up, a question I was asked Ivan the troll was I mean it was it was a kind of a trollish question, but <clears throat> but it it goes along with, you know, like we, we can't really it, it's hard to actually foresee what's what's to come in five to ten years with all this open source technology. But someone was talking about like three D printed guns mounted to the side of a drone. Like it sounds crazy, but we're probably not that far off from it, you know? Like where you could actually have like a flying autonomous like uh uh like a, a flying autonomous like defense system. Um like it's really not that inconceivable. Um, you know, like for home oh, manufacturing. Dude, you- you could do that now. I mean, if you weren't like strictly wanting 3D printing, I'm trying to. I forget the name of the design, but it's it's a hybrid design. Some 3D printed stuff. There's some metal in it, but um, it's basically like a um, kind of like a Tech Nine type of like nine millimeter submachine gun. But oh yeah, you. I'm sure you could make a drone and mount a couple of those to it and have like 60 rounds of um, fun with it. <laughs> 60 rounds of fun. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> I guess, uh, I'm looking back here at, um, at, uh, you know, what we're planning on talking about. And I think we've, we've really covered, uh, covered everything. I guess, um, I, I guess one thing that comes to mind is you mentioned the pirate boxes a few times. Um, I guess, uh, there, there's also freedom boxes. So do you want to spend just a, a minute here? Um, kind of, uh, oh, sure, uh kind sure. of, uh, you know, laying out the basics of those and, and kind of what, what the capabilities are. Sure, sure. Okay. The Freedom Box is a long-running project that is a, an, a, an attempt to get people away from depending so much on the centralization that's happening right now. Um, it's an attempt to decentralize cloud services on your own platforms that you own, um, that you control the security to and everything else. It's Basically, there's a combination of software that it runs through a very simple to use web interface, like configuring a router or something like that. And um, it allows you to host your own wiki. It allows you to host your own like you know files on 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 the web through various ways, including encrypted. You know, you can host your file on Tor. You can. Um, you can be a Tor node. You can you can route all your network traffic through Tor. You can um, operate your own private VPN. Like all these things are possible on a single board computer the size of a Pi, or they can be um, 
install it onto any of the other systems I have as a add-on package. Um, one of the one of the systems that I really think would be um, you know kind of like think of a home server that would serve all your media mm-hmm. and host a, host your your personal cloud stuff and act as your home theater PC. Like, um, so that's kind of, uh, I've built a few platforms like that. I've actually sold one of my prototypes and the person liked it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very simple to just deploy the freedom box stuff right on top of a, uh, you know, home theater slash gaming PC that's Linux based and have all that stuff at the same time. Right. Um, now, depending on your level of security you want, I mean, there's more secure ways to do that. It can even be deployed as a virtual machine. So, I mean, there's different ways. I'm, you know, I'm still doing some R&D to see which is the best way. I've done it both ways. I've deployed them as applications, and I've also deployed them as a, their own virtual machine that's completely isolated. So... Um, I just need more time to uh, flesh things out to decide what I'm going to focus on more. But yeah, they uh, like what what I have personal wiki, um, clouds you know personal cloud storage, um, uh, doc uh, I believe there's document sharing. Um, and well, yeah, that's the personal wiki. Oh crap. I'm like spacing out on all, it does. It's like a Swiss Army knife. It's just like, oh, it has has pr- uh, privacy. <clears throat> excuse me. It has a non-caching privacy proxy on it that eliminates. You know, it's it eliminates all your um, shady internet traffic. Mm. Um, it eliminates ads before they even hit your browser. Nice stuff like that. Yeah. Basically, like a you know U block origin or something like that that's fine tunable that runs on us on the server level that does things to the data before and it can even speed up your internet by just not you know just refusing to accept that you know. Um, but you you know there's also I can also configure it with Squid the caching proxy if you're in my situation. Um, and actually want the internet to be cached locally so it doesn't take as long to do stuff right for example my system here i have a prototype system that i'm putting together that will cache like um a few hundred gigabytes of the internet so even like my problem here is i have dsl it sucks i do a lot of software updates at once and stuff and that'll take all day Mm -hmm. so this way it it, the first system that downloads software updates everything else is getting it from my local cache um, the freedom boxes can be configured to do that with just, you know, using adding squid instead of using, I think it's Privoxy it has on it. So, I mean, like, and squid has all the content filtering too. But it's, I mean, if you're running it strictly for content filtering, that it, it takes a lot more resources to cache. Gotcha. <clears throat> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, that certainly makes sense. Um, but yeah, I, go ahead. Uh, I, I know I, I kind of refer to all this stuff as you know uh, the realm of personal information systems, and it's not really something that uh, it's not really a market that exists so much in the uh, like servile society because it's very easy for everybody just to go buy what's off the shelf and have no concerns for any of the security or the privacy or um, <clears throat> you know or you know anything these systems bring to the table the modularity the uh, the reproducibility, like any of the stuff I do, but he can just do too and do for people like I'm doing. I mean, that's the mm-hmm. whole point of this. Like, you know, I'm nothing. I don't do anything proprietary at all. I don't want anything like I, that. Just, I don't, you know, that's not even my philosophy. Um, I'm trying to, you know, a lot of this is propaganda of the deed. You know, people see me out there with a big wireless antenna doing all this crazy shit. They start thinking about this stuff and start thinking about, well, maybe I should learn how to do this. And, you know, it's the same thing with, you know, basically what, one of the biggest reasons I'm on social media. I, I loathe social media and I loathe the, uh, 
the data that I've given it, but yep. it's the Same propaganda, here. the deed that I've done on there, man. I've got a lot of people to disobey a lot of things, so or you know, helped on their path. Yes, certainly, certainly. So, so I guess um, I, I want to ask you about it. It, it kind of came to mind right now, and it's it's kind of along the same lines that we've been discussing. But um, I'm sure you saw, and uh, <clears throat> I'm sure you saw, and, and obviously, like I see it, kind of uh, you know, a chuckle. But there's still kind of a fuck you um, at the same time. But um, what the uh, that the U.S. Uh, government wants to uh, to ban end-to-end -end encryption apps like Signal. I'm sure you, you saw that today. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Give us yeah, your thoughts. I don't know how far that's going to go. Well, I mean, they can't be in math. Um, yeah, it's just mind-boggling. And what it's going, what it's showing you, really, are the apps that the SIGINT enabling project didn't get its claws deep enough into. You know, the technologies that weren't already completely compromised down to, you know, the the attacker just running like a collection of scripts to own your shit, you know? Um, I don't know. I think, uh, if they make that type of encryption illegal, it'll just be hidden under weaker encryption. Um, because it's still kind of overwhelming. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's a real possibility there. Um, yeah, I don't know. There, there's, there's so much stuff that relies on strong encryption right now too, that, it's kind of like you know, old man yelling in the wind or whatever. Right, right, and I, and I can't, I can't remember, remember who said it, but um, I mean, I mean, there, there have been plenty of people who've said, who've said similar things, but um, basically, um, that they're, they're trying to like, <clears throat> so there, there are these handful of you know events where you know, oh, the iPhone, you know, the iPhone encryption is so strong, the government can't break it, um, so therefore we have to weaken everybody's security. Um, to, you know, for, for those, for, for those very, you know, small amount of, you know, so-called threats. Um, and obviously we, we under, we understand that for what it is. They just, they're, they're trying to make privacy illegal. Um, that's, that, that's what it is. They, they want to have their, uh, they want to have their, uh, you know, eyes and ears and everything. And, um, <clears throat> you know, encryption works. It's just, as Paul Rosenberg said, uh, you know, the, you know, the encryption works, there are bad implementations, but the encryption work is, works if it's installed correctly. Um, so, um, I don't know. Um, we'll, we'll see. Uh, they, they, I, I don't know. Um, it's kind of like all the talk about banning cryptocurrency, right? Um, they can't really just do that. Um, they could, but it would, it wouldn't be, um, you know, it wouldn't work out well in their favor. I don't think. Um, just as uh, this, this certainly wouldn't either. It'd lead to, uh, um, if the United States does it, uh, you know, the Five Eyes intelligence, uh, you know, those, those um, other countries might uh, attempt to do the same thing, and they've tried to do the same thing. So it would lead to just an overall, oh, more, sure. more, an overall more insecure internet. And uh, a lot more people, as you put it, would get owned. <laughs> oh, it's terrible, man. I can't even. I can't even imagine. Like, oh my god, that there are. I'm, I'm sure there's a, you know encryption standards that are used daily. Excuse me. In uh, just basic administration, like in the like SSH and um. You know, secure shell like a lot of remote connections to computers to configure them and manage them and stuff. Like, right? Yeah. Yeah, I can't imagine. Yeah, and if and if you, you've got, it, you've, you've, yeah, you've, you've got to think like if a, if a company has a good IT team, they're going to do everything through like secure FTP, um, and all of that. As far as I understand, all of that stuff is encrypted. Like the the internet is built upon encryption. Um, that's how that's how we do all of our you know e-commerce transactions. That's how we do all of this stuff is because encryption exists. Um, so I don't know. It maybe it maybe if their if their end goal is like the the collapse of society as we know it, um, then you know, <laughs> maybe they will ban it. <laughs> Who knows, right? Well, it's – and um, some of the language I've kind of gleaned from it is more like they're going to go after companies that have products that are using it. Um, you know, how do you go after an open source project that doesn't have borders and doesn't have – you know, that, you know, everybody could space on the project one day and new people could pick it up the next day? How does right. – how does how is that going to work? It's like, you know, any open source insurgency like – all, all the, uh, all the king's mail men have failed to do anything about them, you know, as far as doing anything about uh, them actually existing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's true. That is uh, is very true. Very true. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Just something something I saw today, and I mean, it's I I mean obviously like um if if obviously in the nineties uh you know PGP was considered ammunition. That's 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 common. It's uh somewhat common knowledge nowadays. Um, but uh, it's it's sure. always it's always it's always been a threat. Um, it's always been a threat. Um, and and that's why well, like uh you know like I, I I wish I wish a lot of these open source projects would be further along. I wish um I wish you know some st some privacy stuff with Bitcoin was done already. Um, you know I wish I wish a lot of these things. You know I'm I'm really impatient, but um at the same time I mean it takes um <clears throat> yeah it's um stuff takes time it takes time. Well, and it's a lot different scenario than when there used to be more restriction on encryption like i remember when you could get a 64-bit or 128-bit version of netscape navigator because of the um, export restrictions on encryption at that time so i mean like at that point in time there was so much less encryption being used i mean encrypting the web was actually kind of a new thing that people the technology wasn't necessarily super new but it was something that took a lot of people to jump on the bandwagon like most web traffic was completely unencrypted like not at all like you could use a sniffer and see everything like you, you're like shouting down the street you know what i mean um so yeah and then you know ssl came along and they had the different standards for import and uh domestic use and that was i don't i just can't see how those how the the whole industry could even return to those days. It's just way too proliferated. Now. Right, right. And, and I guess the, and I forgot to get to my point, but the, I, I was talking about how, um, you know, it's, it's been a long time coming to, the, to, to this place. We've got all these tools. Um, just got to be fucking thankful that we have them. Um, because, uh, you know, for, for the longest, for, you know, for, 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 for some time, um, cypherpunks, you know, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to, to, to bring these things in fruition. So, um, you know, things aren't perfect, but, um, you know, we're, I don't know. The, the cypherpunks have always been a couple a couple steps ahead of the reactionary state, so um, that's uh, that's that's certainly yeah, cer certainly a good thing. Cool. And um, it, I mean, also looking at uh, uh, th there's another thing that came to mind. Uh, you're talking about how the, the the beginning of the internet was, you know, everything was, you know, a lot of it was unencrypted traffic. It kind of it kind of um, you know brings it brings a par uh, brings brings uh, you know a thought here like a parallel with Bitcoin that people just kind of assumed it was anonymous. Um, but it's not, it's not an easy thing to, to, you know, have encrypted, you know, encrypted anonymous, um, you know, you know, um, information on the internet. Right. Um, and now like it, there's, there's, <clears throat> um, like with Bitcoin, there's, uh, there's a realization like, holy shit, this, this isn't private. This isn't good. And then there's a lot of projects that are, you know, coming up around that. Um, so I don't know. It, it kind of seems like the parallels with Bitcoin and the internet are very much the same. Um, kind of the, um, the the beginnings the the lack of focus on privacy and also um, just I don't know I'll, I'll I'll stop there and let you let you let you give your thoughts if you have anything. <laughs> oh sure sure um, well definitely and the thing is these tools are so easy to use now I mean it, it used to take a lot of work to do a lot of this stuff and now it's you know clicking check boxes and copying and pasting things from here to there a couple times and mm -hmm. you're configured for and you know really strong encryption that works um and i mean i think what needs to be overcome though with people is everybody has a futility switch where the perceived futility of the situation makes them not want to act mm -hmm. like if you are if you've res Design to yourself that you're going to drown and you're going to stop trying to tread water well then you're going to drown right and um there are some attitudes that are prevalent that really uh really interface with that futility switch with people you know the attitudes of i don't have anything to hide or you know i'm, do I'm not doing anything or i keep e or even i keep anything i want to hide out of that realm um, they don't understand the uh, the real implications of things, um, especially with the emergent technologies like AI. Um, and they don't. There, there's a lot of uh, confusion about uh, you know you know state versus private threats. 
and you know maybe a hyper focus on the state surveillance threat from some people and then some people hyper focus on the quote unquote private sector surveillance threats um so like a lot of the people who hyper focus on the state surveillance threats they they feel it's completely futile to do anything about it so they just don't do anything about it the people that hyper focus the other way you know a lot of the times have the complete opposite you know you know equal but opposite reaction i guess you'd say mm -hmm. so it's you know, a lot of it is just a, a change of attitude and and that only comes about from people understanding the situation um there is a great youtube channel from a uh a hacktivist that goes by the hated one um, he has a great video on the Intel management engine backdoors, but he's done some recent videos on facial recognition and um, just the implement the uh, the implications of the interconnectivity of the private surveillance state just by itself without even factoring in the um, you know the uh, the the, act, the quote unquote state state sec you know public sector mm -hmm. you know and of course if if you're if you're consistent even with like agorist class theory um we don't really have a, a private it sector it doesn't exist we have a good old american fascist it sector mm -hmm. so um it's like american it's america's you know trademark version of uh fascism right and and you said that that guy's youtube channel was the hated one it was the hated something yes okay yeah the hated, the hated one. one okay cool I'll, I'll have to check that out that sounds uh sounds interesting oh yeah it's... cool but um yeah uh and there's another video you might want to check out or just you know maybe put in the show notes that will go a lot in detail about what i'm talking about with iot and how how um ridiculous some of that is and how dangerous it is mm -hmm. there's a dude dude named brian lunduke and he uh he has a uh talk that he did at some linux iot conference called how the internet of things is going to destroy us all okay how but yeah that would be some good information i'd like to okay. spread it okay yeah, yeah. Oh, it's it's worth watching the whole thing. I mean, but it talks about a lot of the things that, you know, some of the starry-eyed people talking about how great it's going to be to have your house connected and everything just, or just must not, just must be ignorant of. Because once you understand this stuff, it's just, none of this stuff, the way it's happening becomes a good idea. And if you could take it in isolation and it wasn't happening in this environment, it would be great. Like, right. for instance... Maybe, you know, there are people like myself, like independent technologists or whatever you want to call us, that could take open source projects and do this stuff for you where you own your house. Well, you own, you know, that AI, well, the AI only answers to you. It's not, it's not snitching on you or, you know, you, you have it hooked to open hab, which is all your automation for your house. And you have strong security that you that you know is heavily audited and it's not like some firmware from some fly by night Chinese company that you bought a surveillance cam off of Amazon from, you know what I mean? It's like, um, which are, you know, constantly being hacked. I mean, Oh, the whole Wi-Fi surveillance camera thing. You're, you're, you're basically giving somebody skilled, um, you know, all your surveillance data. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's uh, it's it's uh, an interesting climate. It certainly is. Um, you know, there, there's a, a lot of things that can oh, certainly that could certainly be used for you know, uh, you know, furthering personal freedom. But um, obviously, there there are people with other you know uh, uh, other uh, special interests and uh, obviously state actors. Um, uh, you know, if if this technology was used in such a way, uh, and some of some of it is, um, it is a threat to them. So obviously, uh, it's uh, it makes sense. But um, 
I, I, I suppose um, we've been talking for about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes here. Um, do you have any, uh, any other uh, closing thoughts for the listeners? Uh, do you have, uh, or, and, uh, you know, uh, make sure to, you know, let them know where they can, uh, where they can find you and, uh, and uh, get some ghost pads. Yeah, sure. Um, again, the email is uh, jamin at semisynthetic.net. And um, not really, uh, don't really have any good closing closing comments. Um, you you have my uh, have my brain in, in in gear now, thinking about something. I'm all spaced out. We think. <laughs> um, oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, I had. I guess I could. Uh, send you a couple good YouTubes I found doing some research for some good YouTubes to send you of some, some how to's. And one of them, this dude uh, goes by Nullbite, and his YouTube show is called cyber weapons lab. And he just goes through, you know, everything I talked about and a lot more as far as the uh, interesting stuff that we were talking about. Mm hmm. And, you know, gives tutorials on how to do it all. And he has a great website, too, that you can follow through the links there. But, yeah, as far as tutorials go, they've been some of the best. So I'm all about trying to spread the spread the skills and get people interested in this stuff. Right, yeah. All, all it takes is a little bit of interest, and uh, um, the crypto-anarchist world will suck you in. Um, that's just, uh, at least from, from, from the people that I, that, uh, that I, that I talk to, that, uh, that tends to happen. Um, there's so much, uh, for, for people interested in, in the prospects for self liberation, um, you know, the tech, the technological realm, um, well, well, it does, uh, you know, provide some, uh, well, it does provide some, some potential vulnerabilities. Uh, there's a lot of great stuff happening on the freedom side. So, um, I, you know, as I, as I've said plenty of times before, Jamin, thank you so much for all of, all of the work that you do. Um, it's it's very very much needed, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm glad you're doing it, and uh, my listeners uh, surely are too. Oh wow! Likewise, man, you do a lot of good stuff for sure. Thank you. I I, I appreciate that. I, I I certainly do. So, uh, uh, anything else, man? Before I let you go? No, not really. Um, I think I said my spiel. All right, fantastic. Well, uh, uh, man, thanks a lot for coming on. I, I certainly do appreciate it. And um, for, for the listeners, uh, please do check out the website, bonniepodcast.com, for podcasts, uh, articles, uh, guest articles, uh, old Bonnie publications, and much more. Uh, again, that is uh, bonniepodcast.com. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in. Until next time, let's build the Agora, and let's build the second row.